Hi, I'm Michael Margarone, Atlantic County Teacher of the Year for 2015-2016. I currently teach freshman world cultures for the Edgar Township High School. And today I'm teaching about historical perspective using primary source documents. In particular, we're going to examine the John F. Kennedy assassination 50 years ago. Previously in this class, my students uh, were given factual information and background about the assassination. Uh, the Edgar Township High School Freshman Academy is organized by cohorts. So my cohort partner, the English teacher, has read with the students the Lady Bird Johnson diaries and the factual accounts of the assassination. In my class, you're going to get to see um, a, a practice of differentiated instruction using um, learning centers to teach the Kennedy assassination. Within this class, uh, students are going to learn how to cite evidence from factual sources. They're going to determine central ideas looking at photographs, um, witness statements, and police reports. They're going to compare and contrast points of views to determine which point of view is more credible than another. And honestly, they are going to learn how to analyze various events and figure out which one is a better source of information. Uh, ultimately, at the end of this class, students should come away with understanding how primary source documents are used and how they can use them to determine the historical accuracy of events. Within this lesson, it's not just history. Students are going to be using math to calculate bullet trajectories. They're going to be examining science and forensics uh, with, the, with regard to the medical evidence and the acoustic evidence. Uh, so there's not just, it's not just social studies you're going to see. You're going to see a little bit of English, a little bit of math, a little bit of science. And that's how we make education relevant using multiple disciplines. All right, guys, today we are continuing our examination and studying of the Kennedy assassination. And the big idea here that I want you guys to examine is how does historical perspective change over time and how can we use historical documents to understand real world historical events? So we have several stations set up. Station number one, the boys are going to take a look at the book depository. They're going to take a look at the shooting itself from the perspective of Lee Harvey Oswald. Was it possible? Over here, where Kate's sitting, is the grassy knoll. Other people thought they heard shots coming from the grassy knoll, which is to the right and front of the president. You're going to take a look at those witness statements. Okay? While you guys are comparing these witness statements, find out who is credible, who is more accurate, and why. Do these witnesses have a bias? All right? Moving around to the front of the room, we've got the president's car. We've got witness statements from Secret Service agents, President or Mrs. Kennedy, Governor Conley. All right, examine those statements. Over here, Alec Reed, one of my first students ever. He's in the MSA Academy. He's going to be talking to you guys about the ballistics. Was it possible to make those three shots in that amount of time? You'll take a look at things such as the magic bullet that was recovered from Governor Conley's thigh. You'll take a look at bullet fragments removed from the president's head. All right. Over here, where Courtney and Maver are sitting, you have the medical evidence. You have the Dallas doctor's report of the president's injuries. You also have the pathology report. Your job is going to be to determine which one is accurate. Why is there a discrepancy on the head wound? Was it in the front right or was it in the rear? And finally, where Nicholas is at, this station is the single bullet. Now, the single bullet is predicated on the idea that a single shot passed through the president's neck hit Governor Conley. The third shot killed the president, and there was another shot that missed. If the single bullet theory works, it could have been the work of a lone gunman. If not, there was a fourth shot and a second rifleman and a conspiracy. So take a couple minutes within your group, and then we'll do a little debrief before I get you guys rotated to your next station. All right, so let's get started. Nicholas, what was your question? Um, I was looking at this, and uh, just from where the hole is in the back, it doesn't make sense how it can go up. You guys can get started within your groups. Neck, and then back down again. Okay. Kind of making like a wave pattern. Okay, why would the president's, here, you can go ahead and have a seat. Why would the president's jacket wound, why would the bullet hole be lower here, but then on the body it's up a little higher? Unless he had his jacket much higher up. Okay. Absolutely. What you guys need to understand is right now he's sitting flush. The president in the pictures, take a look at, what's that, frame 183? What's he doing? He's waving. His shoulder, the jacket material is bunched up. 
there's a very good possibility that the jacket was bunched up and folded over at the time of the first shot that hit his back. So that may account for the discrepancy in the high to low wound. Curtis. That may be true because when, when they heard the first shot fired, mm -hmm. whenever the first shot fired, he looked at their right arm and was still waving. Yeah. And, and so like his arm was high up like this. Sure. Or something like that. And then once the second shot fires, he was probably still waving. Okay. And then the, the shot probably went through the jacket from where he was waving into his neck. Yeah, I mean, the only times I've seen a jacket sit like that is when it's like on a hanger, like right now. But yeah, you have to figure the president was up, he was moving, it could have been bunched up. All right. Carla, what was your question? Obviously, half so, of the time. Like, 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 like
Okay, in this approval film, uh, remember the president said that the heads moved back. Uh, so that could be every shot. Okay, so you've got this approval film with the bell on the right. Ladies and gentlemen, all right, uh, do a quick little debrief. What is, um, what's the most challenging aspect of, of this uh, sequence? Oh, excuse me. What's the most challenging aspect of using historical evidence? Nicholas? Probably trying to find which sources are credible and which aren't, which can be believed and which are changed. OK. Um, can you guys give me an example of evidence that you find credible versus not credible? Well, I don't think any of the people in the car were credible because everything was like, conflict. Yeah, they have all and, like they all have different views. And it was all happening really fast. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, let me ask you guys this. Sal. People in the grassy knoll, were, were their testimonies more credible? Well, some are, some aren't. Most people would not know what happened at the time because most heard shots coming from in front, others heard shots coming from up in the book depository. Okay. And most heard six shots, some heard four shots, some only heard one shot. Okay. So how do we use historical documents and primary sources to really make a, a credible judgment as to historical events? Christian. Okay, finding the similarities between them. All right. What else? How else can we use historical documents? Mary? Maybe like try to ignore how they can look at each other and just like, I don't know, like put yourself in the place of the person that's saying, you know, whatever they're saying. In the okay. All right. Not bad. All right, guys, we're going to uh, get ready to rotate to our next stations. I originally did not want to be an educator. Uh, my original goal when I was in second grade was to become president of the United States. So at the age of 31, I, in my grand vision, was planning on um, being a congressman at this point in my career. But as I matured and went to college and actually worked in Washington, D.C. for a little while as a congressional aide, I realized that the one thing that I enjoy is learning. And what better profession than education? So I actually became a teacher, not to teach, but to learn. And I think the greatest passion I have, the greatest reward from teaching is not teaching content, but teaching skills, building citizenship, and learning from my students. And I think a teacher that constantly learns from their students is an effective teacher. Um, the best teacher I had was a third grade teacher. And when he gave me this original Life magazine of the Kennedy assassination, I became very interested in history and developed a passion for it. So one of the reasons why the Kennedy assassination lesson that, that you were able to witness uh, is so near and dear to my heart. Additionally, teaching in Atlantic County is special. Uh, right now, with the casino struggling, we are at a 13.8% unemployment rate, one of the highest in the state. We are the second, our county is the second in terms of foreclosures. We have a lot of families that are struggling and that are hurting. So it's hard to motivate students and to get them to learn when their families are being affected by um, the economic downtimes that we're, that we're struggling with. And given that, it's the job of the teacher not just to engage them in content, not just to teach them social studies, but really to expand in and broaden their horizons to make the point that there is a connection between what they're learning in school and how it's going to apply to them in the real world. Now, how I've been a leader in the school community. Um, I've served on a number of organizations and, and boards. Uh, but most importantly, aside from developing uh, the lessons, it's being there for the students. I have a motto, choose your attitude, play, make their day. That kind of mantra sums up my educational philosophy because I believe that, that an effective teacher is there to make the student's day at the same time has helped them learn and grow and become mature citizens. So given that, the role of Teacher of the Year is a profound one, and it is the center of action in terms of the students within your classroom.